Good morning. Good morning. I'm Randy Litchfield, the academic dean, and uh, I share a welcome and include that, that welcome from uh, President Jay Rendell. Um, and we're very excited about um, having uh, Dr. Daniel Boyarin with us this, uh, this morning and this evening uh, for the uh, Williams Lectures this year. The Williams Lecture uh, began in 1981 uh, to honor the, the late Dr. Ronald L. Williams, Professor of Theology from 1971 until his death in 1981. The Institute has featured speakers from many backgrounds, including theologians, ethicists, poets, biblical scholars, historians, pastoral psychologists, and Christian educators. Uh, the Williams Lectures are in conjunction with the Methodist Theological School's uh, Theological Commons. The Theological Commons is a means for MTSO to share intellectual resources with the church and the world through dialogue with the broader community by offering events, learning resources, and continuing conversations, the Theological Commons promotes the sharing of knowledge and experience between students, faculty, clergy, and the public for the benefit of all part participants and for those that they serve. Uh, the introduction of our speaker this morning will be uh, provided by Professor John Campen. Um, Dr. Campen is the person that put forward uh, Dr. Boyerin's um, name for this lecture and also they have uh, an extended working relationship in the field during dinner last night when I was asking how long they had known each other that their description of that relationship seemed to have the, the length of a biblical lifespan it seems like so um, a few scores in there I think so uh, with that I uh, would welcome uh, Dr. Campen to do the introductions Good morning. A man with an academic pedigree such as that of today's Williams lecturer has not been the normal fare for our institution. You do not meet one of the world's most acclaimed living scholars of the Talmud in the classrooms and hallways of the Methodist Theological School in Ohio on a regular basis. That happens at Yeshiva University or Jewish Theological Seminary, or even Hebrew Union College. But today is different. Today we're privileged to have Dr. Daniel Boyarin, the Herman P. and Sophia Taubman Professor of Talmudic Culture at the University of California, Berkeley, with us. In the midst of a debate, debates about identity as Christians, followers of Jesus, Jews, spiritual people, Dr. Boyarin has the audacity to muddy the waters even further by questioning the broadly accepted hypothesis that we can identify in a rather linear fashion the manner in which Christianity grew out of Judaism and became an independent religion. Mudding the waters leads me to the story of our first meeting many years ago. I was at the time professor of Bible and academic dean of Payne Theological Seminary, the AME institution down the road in Wilberforce. I was in San Francisco for, at that time, an administrative meeting. I don't have to attend those anymore. <laughs> uh, and I had contacted Dr. Boyarin about an article he'd written in a, which he amounted a vigorous critique of the treatment of Talmudic literature by Cain Hope Felder at Howard University in what was his then very new book, Troubling Biblical Waters. He was largely dependent upon the work of Charles Kofer, the legendary Old Testament scholar at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta. We met at a falafel shop <laughs> at a table on the street in downtown San Francisco. Dr. Boyarin backed down on none of his critique. However, I knew I had been in the presence 
of a man of towering intellect with command of a massive number and variety of texts. He was also very methodological and astute and well informed. Note that he also teaches in areas such as gender studies, gay lesbian, relation, uh, gay lesbian studies, women's studies at UC Berkeley, and published in the area of gender studies on Jewish texts. But most of all, at that first meeting, I was impressed with his devotion to the text. That what people had written in those texts really mattered and had consequences. Well, that was the first of many encounters and meetings over the years, uh, stretching from uh, San Francisco to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, uh, in which, uh, and in all of those meetings, my esteem for his work has only risen. Daniel Boyarn has both a master's and doctorate from the Jewish Theological Seminary, as well as a master's in Semitic languages from Columbia. For those of you that aren't in Jewish studies, that pedigree is the gold standard, particularly the gold standard at the time that Jewish studies was being established as an independent discipline. There's no better list of schools if you are going to be a major voice in Jewish studies uh, at, the begin at the end of the previous century and the beginning of this one. In the field of Talmudic studies, Boyarin distinguished himself by arguing for a new theory of the redaction of the Babylonian Talmud that I will not explain today. <laughs> Today in academic meetings, you will hear references to the Berkeley School of Study. That's Dr. Boyarn and his students. He also turned his attention to Greek and Latin literature, as had Professor Saul Lieberman, one of his student teachers. Boyarn engaged the Christian texts with the same zeal and insight that has characterized his work on the Talmud. It is out of the interaction of these two sets of texts that Dr. Boyarin began to develop the theories that make his work of interest and relevance for a Christian seminary today. With his understanding that the Talmudic culture developed and became central to Jewish life a number of centuries later than most scholars had assumed up to that time, Boyarin argued that these developments, and in particular the, the institutional manifestations of what we know as Judaism, developed out of the evolving Christian structures of the Roman Empire. In other words, Christianity did not grow out of Judaism. Judaism, as we know it, grew out of Christianity. This, of course, is a gross oversimplification of a thesis that actually argues for an ongoing and complicated interconnection between the two, rather than any linear development resulting in independence. And those of you that have been in my rabbinic literature classes have read articles by Dr. Boyarn. There is no parting of the ways, except in specific instances and in the relationship between them. They keep redefining themselves. Such a theory can only emerge from the work of a man that has a good command of all the relevant literature, very rare in our day of specialization. You'll find only a few of his many books listed in your program. Uh, I would want to add another recent title uh, that is a very significant book, but I have to say it because it's such a wonderful title, uh, Socrates and the Fat Rabbis. You want to add that to your list. As I invite Dr. Boyarin to the podium, I invite you to listen to a very accomplished scholar, unafraid to advance provocative theories, and to defend them vigorously, but always with a mischievous glitter in his eyes, indicating that he is enjoying himself and that he is intensely curious about your response. Welcome. I, I, I have to begin by pointing out two exaggerations in those um, introductions. Uh, despite appearances, I am not 900 years old. 
and my Latin is very weak. My Greek is a lot better than my Latin. That's why I don't write about Latin texts. And that's my first lesson for today. Learn the languages. One version of a title for this paper is Two Notes on the Jewishness of the New Testament. So I begin with uh, the discussion of passage from the letter to the Hebrews. I am far from being a Hebrew scholar, very far indeed. My purpose in this brief paper is to offer a reading of aspects of the text from the perspective of a rank and file outsider, a Hebrew scholar, if not a scholar of Hebrews. I do not seek to supersede the interpretations of expert New Testament scholars, but to supplement them by turning up the volume and more precisely focusing the midrashic nature of one crucial passage in the epistle. My modest suggestion is that Hebrews is resounding in a much more Jewish soundscape than is usually predicated of it. On my first reading of Hebrews, my immediate and powerful impression was that this is Midrash, Midrash in style, Midrashic even in the structure of its content. I wish here in this brief communique to put some flesh on the bones of that impression. The homily on Psalms 95 and Hebrews 3, 4 is Midrash. Many New Testament scholars have recognized this. As a scholar of Midrash, I hope here to cash out that insight a bit more richly than the New Testament critics have been able to. I want first to focus on the Midrashic function of the word today in this New Testament Midrash. Let me begin by quoting the relevant verses from the epistle which you have on your handout. I don't do PowerPoint presentations. I always have paper handouts. This is partly because I'm just a Lud Luddite. I have never, well, not, no, I don't want to say I've never seen a PowerPoint presentation that I enjoyed. I think once <laughs> I, I saw one where somebody had figured out that what, what PowerPoint is good for is to show pictures, you know? <laughs> but I am appalled at practices that involve putting, essentially putting the lecture or a very detailed outline on the screen and then reading to, to people what they have on, what they, what they see on the screen, which just seems to me to be a confusion of oral and written Torah that we're uh, enjoined to avoid. Se secondly, the great, the great virtue of handouts is you can make notes right on the, the page. Although, although I saw briefly a, um, a classroom you have here where, um, um, uh, Dean uh, Litchfield showed me a classroom where Professor Park was teaching where, you, where they have an electronic version of that, where the students can make notes on the, on the, the thing that's being projected, but, but that's, um, I'm, I'm too old to learn how to do that. So, so you have handouts. Okay. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors put me to the test, though they had seen my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, and I said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. As in my anger I swore, they will not enter, enter my rest. Take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partners of Christ, if only we hold our first confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now, who were they who heard and yet were rebellious? Was it not all who left Egypt under the leadership of Moses? But with whom was he angry 40 years? 
Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, if not those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Now standard commentaries give fairly neutral interpretations to verse 13. So for instance, Bruce, an excellent commentator on the New Testament, writes on this, while this time lasts, each succeeding day is a fresh today in which they may heed the psalmist's warning to hear the voice of God. Why don't you see a fairly flat, fairly neutral reading of today? Hardly rendering much sense at all to as long as it is called today. Attridge's comment comes closer to the force of today for this midrash. The comment continues to echo the words of the psalm, indicating that this exhortation should take place each day. That is, while the today of the scripture is spoken of as a present reality. At least there he catches that it's an allusion to the today in the, uh, in the, in the psalm, today if you hear my voice. But again, a fairly, what should I say, a fairly colorless uh, almost uh, liberalish, modernish sense, you know, of, uh, of whoever would imagine that, that scripture is ever spoken as anything but a present reality <laughs> before the 19th century, you know, before. And so Lane sharpens the point further, emphasizing the qualitative point of today. The danger of apostasy and sin persists so long as the moment of demand and, and opportunity, which is called today, is valid. Lane's reading can be supported strongly via appeal to midrashic usage and a parallel. In good midrashic form, as long as it is called today, is a shorthand for the verse as a whole. Right? So when it says, as long as it is called today, it doesn't mean Today, it means today if you hear my voice, right? It's an allusion to the whole verse, and this is the way, the, this is the way Midrash works. It expects you to, to, to know the whole Bible by heart, which they seem to have done. Now, some people think that, that, uh, that the, we've, you know, we've got the wonders of modern technology that enable us to look things up and uh, you know, and uh, probably half of you have some devices in your in your pockets that would enable you to check uh, of, to check on my Hebrew as I'm speaking or whatever. Um, we think that this this has given us a great power as scholars and readers of of Scripture. No, this was God's way of compensating for the fact that we don't have half the memory that our ancestors had. So you know. He sent us these little devices um, <laughs> to, um, yeah. Anyway, so today becomes a coded reference for obeying the word of God as a sort of synecdoche of the verse, yielding the following sense. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called Today, if you hear my voice, that is a day in which you hear the voice of the Lord, so that none of you may be hardened, continuing the verse, as at Kadesh, by the deceitfulness of sin, which is the sequel to the verse, right? So that when he says, as long as it is called today, it is alluding to the whole verse and its context. A day in which the faithful are indeed faithful is the day known as today. Those Israelites who were unfaithful at Kadesh were not able to enter into the rest. But those who will make it a today when you hear my voice will enter into my rest. In my view, this Midrash style reading of the verse renders it a much stronger and more vivid moment in the homily as a whole. As it happens, there is a lovely parallel to this reading of the verse from a considerably later rabbinic text. In this remarkable text, according to the Babylonian Talmud, it is the Messiah himself who has given this Midrashic reading to today as an allusion to the whole clause of the verse. 
Here is the text. You have it again on the handout. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi encountered Elijah the prophet standing at the grave of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. He asked him, right? if you meet a prophet on the road, ask him questions. He asked him, will I enter the next world? He, the prophet, said to him, if this master, that is Rabbi Shimon, lying there in the grave, desires it. He said to him, that is, Rabbi Yoshua said to him, the two of us I have seen, the voice of the third, Rabbi Shimon, I have not heard. That is to say, I haven't received any answer from you. He said to him, to Elijah, when will the Messiah come? Elijah answered, replied to him, go ask him himself. Where does he sit? At the gates of Rome. And what is the sign by which I will recognize him? He sits among the poor suffering from diseases, and all of them loosen and tighten all their bandages at one time. And he loosens one at a time and tightens it, then another and another, saying, perhaps I will be required, and this way I won't delay. Right, if he had unwrapped all his bandages at once and God wants him to come and be the Messiah, appear as the Messiah and save the world right at that moment, he won't be, what's he going to do? Say to God, no, it's going to take me 15 minutes to, to wrap up all my bandages again. So <clears throat> he undoes one bandage and reties it, one another and reties it so that at any second um, he will be able to uh, answer the call of, of, of God. Uh, to be the Redeemer. Uh, but by the way, not so incidentally, this text, I think, quite completely, along with many others that, I, that I, I've written about, undermines the notion that a suffering Messiah um, is anathema to, uh, uh, to Jews, right? as opposed to Christians. So he, that is Yahushua, went to him, the Messiah, and said to him, Peace be with you, my master and teacher. And the Messiah answered him, Peace be with you, son of Levi. He said to him, When will the master come? He, the Messiah, said to him, Today. Yahushua came to Elijah, who asked him, What did he say to you? He said, He said to me, Peace be with you, son of Levi. Elijah said, I promise that you and your father will come into the next world, answering the first question, right? Because if the Messiah said, peace be with you, son of Levi, he, Yoshua, said, however, he lied to me, for he said, today I, will, today I will come, and the day is over, and he has not come. He, Elijah, said to him and explained, this is to what he referred Today, if you will hear my voice. Right? So when the Messiah says, I will come today, he means he will come on the day when all of Israel hears God's voice. And that's what today means, right? I hope this gives some sort of a, more of a sense of the power of if it is called today in, in, in that uh, homily in Hebrews and how flat it is uh, without that uh, perspective that today is a code word for hearing the voice of God. Right? That is, on the day when the people will be obedient to God, on that day known as today, the redemption will come. The use of the allusion to today, to today is precisely the same in these otherwise quite different texts, Hebrews and the Talmud. The one word today is used as an allusion to the verse today, if you will hear my voice. And in both cases, in the messianic context, precisely in the messianic context. Without ascribing the slightest chance of influence in either direction, vis-a-vis -vis the particular, the strategy of use of the single word, word as synecdoche for the verse seems to strongly mark the connection of our author of Hebrews to midrashic styles of thinking about verses, and thus also to help us to antedate those styles of thinking themselves, antedate them prior to their attestation with, within rabbinic texts from the third century and later. 
Right? We used to talk about the, the rabbinic background to the New Testament and, you know, Strack Billerbeck, um, um, you know, four volumes of background to the New Testament and rabbinic texts. But as my dear friend John pointed out, I have been arguing for years that it should be the exact re reverse. So I've actually um, had the notion of doing a Strack Billerbeck in reverse, in which the rabbinic texts are in the center, and we see how various strategies, ideas, um, interpretative moves can be antedated by showing that they're already in the gospel. Right? I've been accused of being a supersessionist, you know. <laughs> um, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin is thus a midrashic para paraphrase of that verse which being interpreted means exhort one another every day if it is called a today in which you will listen to my voice lest any of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin as in the rebellion at Kaddish. So now, if it is called today, is not the condition for the exhortation, it's the content of the exhortation. When we move on to the second part of this homily in Hebrews, we will see other midrashic patternings at work. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest is still open, let us take care that none of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For indeed the good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, those at Kadesh, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, as in my anger I swore, they shall not enter my rest though his works were finished at the foundation of the world. For in one place it speaks about the seventh day as follows, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place it says, they shall not enter my rest. Right? This place is the psalm. Since therefore it remains open for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again he sets a certain day, Today, saying through David much later, much later than creation, much later than Kadesh, in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak later about another day through David. So then a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God, for those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fail through such disobedience as theirs. Although I might very well have missed it, it seems to me that lacking in the hermeneutical tradition is sufficient emphasis on the fact that Psalm 95 is itself a homily. Right? Psalm 95 is itself a homily. I read a lot of commentaries on Hebrews, modern commentaries on Hebrews, and I, I didn't see that anybody remarked that and how crucial, uh, how crucial that will be in understanding the homily in Hebrews. But as I've learned to my excitement, um, sometimes you got to look a lot earlier than the 20th century. Uh, and, uh, not in this particular case, but in others, I have found Matthew Henry to be one of the surest guides to uh, reading, uh, reading of New Testament. Um, I believe an Anabaptist commentator from the 17th century, whom I never would have come across, except that when I go looking for verses sometimes, you know, I use, you know, I just Google a verse and get whatever website gives me the verse, and sometimes they give me a lot of commentaries also, and I saw, so, well, he understood something that was forgotten later on. But that has to do with my evening lecture. 
The congregation listening to this psalm is being exhorted not to behave as their ancestors did in the desert at Kadesh, lest the same fate befall them, right? So the speaker of the psalm is already a preacher, and he is referring back to the rebellion at Kadesh and exhorting his folk, right? King David, let's say, right, is giving a sermon, and exhorting his people not to fall into the uh, trap that the, the Israelites fell into at Kadesh. Now Hebrews simply builds his homily on the logic of the one in Psalms. For that one clearly, as I've just said, refers to two times, an ancient one and a contemporary one. Today, if you hear my voice, refers to the time of the homilist of the psalm, the Holy Spirit speaking through David. He is our God and we are his flock. If today you will hear his voice. Since, as it were, that time, the time of the psalm, is not defined historically, the homilist behind Hebrews reads it entirely legitimately as being for all time, continuing as in the Talmud, the figura of today, as not being itself temporal, temporal but tropological, signifying obedience or faith. Before the homilist says anything further, it is clear that the rest referred to in the psalm cannot be the rest in the Holy Land, denied the faithless at Kadesh, for that had certainly been taken care of long before David. I mean, David was about to become king of the, of, uh, 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 or had already become king, you know, uh, if we imagine that David actually wrote Psalm 95, right? So, I mean, in, 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 the, in the world of the homilist, um, that had been taken care of. So if David is still exhorting his congregation not to do that which will exclude them from rest, it can't mean entry into the Holy Land and, and, and uh, Israelite sovereignty there. It's got to mean something else. So it must signify some other rest still open in David's time, still pending, and thus still losable for the addressees of the Holy Spirit in the homily in the psalm as for the homily in Hebrews as well. So far, we have just plain good close reading on the part of the Hebrews author. I thus somewhat disagree with Atridge, who ex explicates, quote, it remains for some to enter God's rest, and the previous recipients of the promise failed to do so because of disobedience. God then set another date for the fulfillment, the today of the psalm. I'm still reading Atridge. This offer definitively proves that the promise was not realized by Joshua, and it remains open for those who currently hear the psalm to join in the festive Sabbath rest that God enjoys, end quote. In my humble view, this doesn't quite capture the subtleties of the hermeneutics here, which emphasize that the psalmist himself, already a homilist, is drawing an analogy from the generation of the desert to the present generation of all time. As they failed to enter into the rest of their time, the promised land, owing to their disobedience, you, on the other hand, may yet achieve the rest promised you, if it is today, the forever day in which you hear my voice. Had the rest intended by the psalm meant the rest into which the next generation of Israelites did in fact enter just 40 years later, namely the promised land, then there would remain no rest for the psalmist to be promising or threatening the denial of which. I emphasize again, this is in some non-trivial way the simple meaning of the psalm. Right? So uh, look how far back we have to get to get the... Um, the simple, uh, straightforward uh, understanding of the psalm. In other words, I'm suggesting that it is not the nature of the rest that demonstrates that it still remains open, pace atridge, but the psalm itself that does that. The rest must still be an open question, as the author of Hebrews get notes. This then brings up the necessary question, what is this rest that the psalmist warns about and promises since it is palpably not the rest achieved by Joshua? And now comes the Midrashic moment, identified but I think slightly misapprehended so far. What the homilist wishes to do is to, 
to propose an anagogical meaning building on the tropological already exposed. The rest in question cannot be the physical rest of being in the land and thus must signify something else. The answer to this exegetical question is found through midrashic means, as we will see. All the commentators I am consulting correctly identified the passage as midrash, but none of them get it quite right. This is neither the fairly arcane gzeirah shavah, don't worry about what that means because I'm saying it's not that, <laughs> nor the rara avis of solving a contradiction between two verses by citing a third, nor surely the midrash pesher, an, an avis so rara that no one has ever seen one in captivity or in the wild. What we have here is Midrash simplex, the interpretation of Bible by Bible, the reading of the Bible as one giant literary context. And that, my, my friends, is my definition of Midrash. An apparent oddity in the terminology provides the key to reading this as Midrash. Remember, it says, for in one place it speaks about the seventh day as follows, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, it says, they shall not enter my rest. The term in one place, pu, used here is passing strange. Atridge compares it appropriately enough to similar indefinite usages in Philo and glosses it as, quote, probably reflecting a common homiletic practice whereby the expositor does not dwell on what is commonly known or presupposed, end quote. Again, Pache Atridge. I would suggest that this is a reflection of a very common midrashic formula. And far from suggesting that the matter is commonly known or presupposed, it indicates the major hermeneutical point to be made. Verses are frequently cited in the midrash as places. The Hebrew term is bemakom echad, in one place, i.e. in one verse, that will now be compared with another verse to make a point. The point that the Midrashist wants to make about the verses and their meaning. Frequently we find in early Midrash the expression bim komot harbei, meaning in several verses, right? So place means verse. So when he says pu, somewhere or in some place, he means in one verse. And when he says in another place, he means in another verse. This is very, it's very important to observe that. Our Jewish Jesus, following Midrashist, wishes to explain what my rest could be, since it is clearly not the geophysical rest of entry into Palestine. The speaker of the psalm is, as it were, God through the Holy Spirit. There is also nothing at all unusual in this when read from a Jewish perspective. Midrash constantly refers to a he who is the speaker of the Bible. He says, and he says, and also palin, he says, precisely in the context of citations of verse in Midrash. Hu omer, v'chen hu omer, u'bemakom acher hu omer, for those of you who have been um, uh, attentive to Professor Parks and Professor Campen's uh, courses in Hebrew. If God is claiming a rest that is his, where do we find that rest? It almost demands a reading as the Sabbath, the Sabbath that belongs to God, thus the heavenly Sabbath. In order to make that point, he simply cites a verse in which it is claimed that God has a Sabbath, a day of rest. That verse is Exodus 20.11 in which we read, For six days God made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and God rested on the seventh day. Therefore, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. God rested, so God has a Sabbath. So there's a Sabbath in heaven. The use of palin, right, here, is also garden, in, in, in the Greek of, uh, of Hebrews, is also garden variety midrashic terminology for the simple kind of interpretation of one passage by citation of another. It is into that rest that the psalmist, long after the desert days, encourages his congregation to enter. 
and warns them of the consequences of behaving like that long ago desert generation of rebels. Do not make it another day of rebellion in which you will once again be denied entry into God's Sabbath just as they were denied entry into the land. Right? So it, it's, it's anagogical. They were denied entry into the physical land, but that's already been solved a generation later. So the, uh, the, the anag anagogue is they were denied entry into the, into the physical land, you will be denied entry into, the, into God's rest in heaven. But make sure it is it today if you obey his voice, and thus a time of redemption. Now the rabbis also give an eschatological reading to the rest in this verse and Sabbath altogether. As Atridge has mentioned and Lane also has emphasized, over the course of time a distinctly eschatological concept of rest developed presumably through synagogue preaching and school debate. Perhaps the most poignant of these school debates is the following from the Talmud. Said Rav Katina, the world exists for 6,000 years and then 1,000 of desolation, as it says, and on that day God will be exalted alone. Abaye said, 2,000 years it will be desolate. For it says, he will make us live after two days. On the third day, he will resurrect us, and we will live before him. There is an early authority that supports the view of Rav Katina. Namely, just as the seventh year makes the land fallow for one year in seven, thus the world lies fallow for 1,000 in 7,000 years. For it is said, and on that day, God will be exalted alone. And he says, right, that Midrashic usage, v'chen hu omer, exactly as we find in Hebrews, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day, the day that is entirely Sabbath. And he says, for a thousand years in your eyes are as a yesterday, for it will pass. Right, so if a thousand years in the eyes of God are as a day, as a yesterday, so the, a, a week of years will consist of 6,000 years and then a thousand years Sabbath. Translated into Greek and with the typical trappings of debate edited out, that early tradition cited could almost be from the epistle to the Hebrews. Note the katana like citation of several verses. But this is not just a katana, but an argument made through these citations. Thus, for the homily of Hebrews as well, I wouldn't dream, of course, of thinking of a rabbinic background to Hebrews, nor even of so-called Jewish influence on the book. I would rather see the, the book of Hebrews as a Jewish text, a homily, presumably closely related to other Jewish homilies of the time in style, and to a great extent, yet to be determined and specified in content as well. With a twist, of course, a fateful twist, the turn to, to Jesus, but not a whole new martini. This very preliminary study should be seen as a partial propodeutic for a renewed study of the Jewish context of the Christology of Hebrews. Perhaps we ought to be allowing into the theorized genealogy of Hebrews some deeper and wider connections with the hermeneutical resources from which Palestinian Midrash developed as well. As such, Hebrews may provide very important and exciting evidence for the existence of Midrashic forms earlier than any attestations in Palestinian Hebrew literature. That's what I have to say about Hebrews. Now, how am I doing for time? Because I've, I've not got another piece about the same length about Revelation, but I could stop here, or I could... Well, I won't be able to stop in the middle, so... Uh, I have about 15 minutes. I'll stop here. <laughs> no, because I don't want to get halfway through an argument about Revelation. As you see, the kinds of arguments I make are very complicated, and to stop in the middle would really be... Um, I'll make that available to, to folks in writing. Yeah. So...
Dr. Boyer. Uh, now uh, we will be having time over lunch to be in conversation as, as well. So in, invite uh, questions or uh, comments for conversation. What is the argument among other Jewish um, rabbis that disagree with you on this interpretation? Um, excellent question. Uh, the, fr the first uh, problem that I raise for traditionalist folks is that I don't take seriously, or I mean I take them seriously, uh, hermeneutically, but I don't um, b believe the ascriptions to particular rabbis that are given in the Talmudic text. There is so much evidence that much of the material, at the very least, has undergone so much reworking in the hundreds of years between when those rabbis lived, let's say, in the, in the first century and the beginning of the second century, and by the time we meet their work, their words, in a text that was, that was produced four or five hundred years later. You know, we know what four or five hundred years is. I mean, I could take the Mishnah and put it right next to the Talmud on a shelf. But that doesn't capture the fact that there are 400 years in between them. Um, uh, so that, uh, so there, there, there certainly is a both pious, but also a what they consider to be a scholarly conservative tradition. That if it says Rabbi Akiva said this, it means that Rabbi Akiva said it, and therefore it should be ascribed to. Uh, the um, early second century. If it says Robin Gamliel said it, well, we know Robin Gamliel was. He was Paul's teacher, right? Um, so that uh, that that is uh, that had been the first point of contention. I, I would like to say that that battle is finally pretty much won, except in real Pietist circles, um, the so-called ultra-orthodox, and I hate that term. Uh, for many reasons. Um, and I don't believe in ultra, you know, um, what is this ultra? That's a, a, a value judgment. I, mean, I don't know whether to, they, they, I don't like orthodox and I don't like ultra. And so, uh, so but in real pietist circles that, uh, where that kind of, um, you know, what I would call fundamentalism, in, in in the, in the true sense of the word fundamentalism, which is not, you know, we, we use the word fundamentalism to mean something like fanatic or militant or, uh, or but I'm talking about biblical literalism, so there's a kind of Talmudic li literalism also um, that, that I would call uh, fundamentalism. Um, in, in, in scholarly circles, that, as I say, that battle has been won. Uh, First in the United States, um, now pretty much the younger generation of Israeli scholars are also uh, uh, thinking about the chronology in this completely different way. Secondly, it had been tough to convince folks that the New Testament can be and ought to be read as part and parcel of the Jewish literature of, um, of the first century. In fact, our best evidence for Jewish piety in the first century. Right? That, um, you can imagine that that was a tough sell, and that was a tough sell in, in, in two directions, right? Nobody liked it. Um, I, I gave a lecture on the on the on the uh, prologue to John um, at Grinnell College. Oh, must be ten or twelve years ago, in the chapel at Grinnell, you know. And there I produced my um, infamous argument that the prologue to John is not a hymn or a poem, but a Jewish sermon. And one that I said could could have been heard in any synagogue in the Greek-speaking Jewish world at the time. 
a very, very agitated undergraduate got up afterwards and asked the first question, literally shaking with rage. And he said, who are you and why are you trying to take our gospel away from us? <laughs> so, uh, so there, 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 there's, there, there, is, there is a threat. More of a threat in this than in the first, um, and then, and then, and of course, one of the consequences of my work, unintended perhaps, but nonetheless, very real, and and I can live with it, is that Messianic Jews have been taking up my work, and you know, citing me, precisely because I'm not a Messianic Jew. As, you know, because what's the point of citing one of your own? You cite one of your own. Everybody could say, no, 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 you know, uh, the, another, another one of those uh, confused people who can't tell the difference between Jews and Christians, right? But when they, can cite, when they can cite somebody who looks like me and, and um, other, than, other than for the odd wedding or so has been in an actual church maybe... Uh, four times in my life, right? Um, then, uh, then that, uh, you know, that, that has made me very popular uh, among Messianic Jewish circles. As I said, I don't have a problem with that. M when, I, when I speak to Messianic Jews who want to claim that they are harking back to the first century Palestinian followers of Jesus, I said, the first thing you've got to do is let go of the Nicene Creed if you want to be real Messianic Jews, right? I don't have any problem with Trinity. I don't have any problem with Incarnation, as I showed in my recent book. Those are both, um, the seeds of both are already there in, in first century Jewish writing. But um, three, sub, three persons and one you know, God and the, uh, all of that complication, uh, that, to, for, to my mind, Nicaea was designed precisely to make the final break with, with, with uh, uh, Jews, right? I see Nicaea, that that is really what's going on in Nicaea, is by imposing on the whole Christian world an orthodoxy that is, that cuts Right? That, and, 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 and in fact, um, Arians and other sundry now named heretics were called Jews and Judaizers by, by, uh, by Nicene folk. This explains, uh, for instance, why um, the date of Easter was so fraught. Because half the church was having Easter when the Jews had Passover. And this, this became, you know, the, uh, other than the theological, the great issue in, uh, at Nicaea because precisely the project is to make that break, right? So in the fourth century is when, when, we, when we find something like uh, a, a definitive break. So you can't both claim to be Messianic Jews and Nicene Christians. That's, that's my message to them, right? You want to be Messianic Jews? Be Messianic Jews. But you're going to have to make more of a break with the Orthodox churches because Messianic Judaism is, from the perspective of Nicene Orthodox Christianity, a kind of heresy. Even, even, even more than it's a kind of heresy from the perspective of, of, of Jews, right? Uh, um, so the fact that I am cited that my work is cited by Messianic Jewish websites all over um, as proving, which it's a, it's kind of a misreading, to, but as proving that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, that's not at all my argument. My argument was that Jesus was a plausible Jewish Messiah. And the argument between Jews and Jews was whether he was the one. Not 
that it was impossible that a human being would be revealed who would be a adjoining of the divine and the and the human in one person. Not that it was impossible that God would send his logos to the world in the form of a human. That was not a problem. The argument was, this kid, you know, the son of that carpenter, is he the one? Or should we look for another, exactly, or wait for another, right, exactly. And that's a very, very typical kind of Jewish argument that takes place over and over again. Some thought that Hezekiah was the Messiah. Um, 150 years or so after Jesus, uh, uh, there was a big battle among Jews about whether Bar Kokhba was the Messiah or not. I mean, that's just sort of. Uh, uh, but the, uh, so so they, they, they gloss over that particular point. So this has made a lot of Jews angry at me. This has made a lot of Jews angry at me. They say that I am... That's not mine. <laughs> it may have sounded like mine, but it isn't. Mine plays a different melody. <laughs> so, and it's a phone call from... Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> saying, saying, watch out, you know? <laughs> In our, in our congregation, um, the, the synagogue that I used to pray in for many years, we had a young rabbi who, who used to give sort of free-form sermons. His wife would sit in the back, and when she thought he was about to get into trouble, she would raise her finger, and he would stop in mid-sentence. <laughs> <laughs> And there was absolutely nothing secretive about this. Right? It was it was just right out there. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah. I uh, just one more sentence. I can't I can't resist this. Um, what I'm doing is t I'm taking back the quarter of an hour that I was uh, supposed to keep lecturing, but by telling you everything I know. <laughs> uh, Many times I'm approached by Christians who say, why did the Jews reject Jesus? You know what my answer is? Who do you think accepted Jesus? <laughs> right? And then I say, you know Jews. You expect all Jews to agree on anything? <laughs> It kind of detoxifies the issue, right? It detoxifies the issue. It wasn't the Jews who rejected Jesus. Jews had an argument about whether or not this man was the Messiah. And from a, 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 a latter-day Jewish perspective, When then people ask why I don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, my problem is not that he was that he suffered. My problem is not that he was killed on the cross. I don't have any problem with the possibility that he was resurrected, and then taken up into heaven. All that fits within within the framework of of, of possible Jewish belief. He didn't redeem the world. The world is palpably not redeemed. That's my problem with. So, in my reading, and you can tell me I'm all wrong on this. In my reading, much of much of of Christian theology substituted a sense of individual redemption for global redemption. Right. Um, and and I can understand that. I mean, I, I can uh, you know, uh, but that's the part that I and other non-Messianic Jews find it difficult to swallow. That's not our understanding of, of, of the way the world is going to look after the Messiah comes. So I know there's going to be a second coming. I know that Christians believe that there's going to be a second coming. So, so the whole argument is whether it's the second coming or the first coming. But, uh, but the redemption is not here yet. Right? And I would have absolutely no problem 
with Jesus being the Messiah. As long as whoever the Messiah is, Jesus or some, somebody else, redeems the world. So, yeah. We were just talking about wearing watches before, not. <laughs> well, I think we can take. Uh, well, actually, with that applause, me, this is a good break now. <laughs> um, we we do have uh, provisions for uh, a lunch conversation uh, up in the Dunn Dining Hall. Uh, everyone is is welcome to uh, a meal up there. We'll after we have some uh, time for uh, ref refreshing ourselves with food. Uh, will provide an opportunity for dialogue, further dialogue and conversation um, at, at that point. So, and, and I promise no more sermons. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they're quite good. Um, so, uh, again, um, thank you for participating in this part of the, the Institute. Uh, thank you, Dr. Boyarian, for um, your wisdom this morning, and uh, we invite you to come up and join us uh, in the dining hall. This evening, if you're not able to join us for lunch this evening, this program begins at 7 o'clock here. So I hope you can join us at that time as well. Thank you.